you are listening to the Unsung Podcast, where we talk about albums that we think are unsung classics, and then you guys tell us if you're right or wrong. This is the Unsung Podcast. You're listening to the Unsung Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Fraser, and I'm joined by two men who, together with me, have started the new hip hop collective. What are we called, Mark? Uh, we're called Jog Steve. the Baker. Baker? <laughs> Jog uh, the Baker. Jog the Baker. What's the Baker got to do with jewels? What? I was going to do oh, run the th- jewels, but change it to jog the jog uh, the jog the gold. Yeah, <laughs> jog, the, jog the ring. Jog I, the ring. I didn't pick up on that. I was just thinking about food <laughs> <laughs> uh, and croissants were the first thing to come into my head. Do you remember those, David? Ah, uh, you get vegan croissant uh, occasionally, bet just as good. But um, Are they flaky? he said insincerely. So to my right, he's trying to make this uh, hip hop duo uh, do the first ever um, rap uh, concept album about croissants. <laughs> it's uh, Mr. Chris Cusack, <laughs> the <one>. pasty pastry <laughs> himself, MC Pasty. <laughs> <laughs> track one, almond. Track two, chocolate filled. Do you have a? Did you have it back when you were able to eat them? Did you have a preference? I mean, just a basic croissant with Nutella in it, and then I suppose a pan au chocolat, which doesn't count as a croissant because it's not in the shape of a crescent, is it? It's just a pastry with chocolate in it. I just like all... T- I l- just love pastry. <laughs> to my, to I miss my pastry. <laughs> I miss pastry so much. I totally. <laughs> I can tell. I see your eyes. <sighs> MC chocolate injection. Uh, <laughs> chocolate injection. I'm pretty sure that's something very different. I'm pretty sure that's a film that's been banned in many <laughs> states. Probably not backstage at rap concerts because having put them on, it seems like anything goes. What yeah, does that, that mean? Sounds like a story. Oh, there's so many stories. Was that was that a member of the Wu Tang Clan? <laughs> it was a member of the Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> and Pringles tubs are big, so that must have taken a long time <laughs> <laughs> to inject the chocolate. Oh, I, I wish it had been brown. Brown would have been better. <laughs> wow! Oh, wow! I've forgotten all my notes. Suddenly <laughs> twitching. Um, yeah. So. We are going to do a hip hop album this week, and I kind of figured. You didn't even introduce David. How, how fucking rude of you! Oh, we know it by now. So, uh, sometimes I hog the limelight, and <laughs> I figured this time, guys, I'm going to let you guys take it with the hip hop. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> are you not? Are you not feeling up to scratch on uh, this? I, I just don't want to be such an alpha male. No, this is your record, Mark. You put yeah, this uh-huh. forward. Um, you're a big LP fan. Big LP fan, yeah, but it was between this and I'll Sleep When You're Dead for me. I really like Run The Jewels a lot, and this this record's a lot closer in sound. Which record? This record, Cancer For Cure, by LP. The one that we're going to do. we're doing today. We're just on the title of the podcast, I should I hasten to add. Um, I think uh, that seems like the logical conclusion of the sound that he's been kind of ploughing for, for the past, I guess, decade before this. Mm-hmm. Um, 15 years before this. Like his first record was 2002, Fantastic Damage. Yeah, but he'd been... I mean, the Cam Blocks record, the Cam Blocks record was before that. And Smug, the Wikipedia Chris stuff, over here. The Co Flow stuff came out in 1998, I think. So he'd been producing for of a while. Course. Um, of course. But this is um, kind of sci-fi, right? It's got a kind of sci-fi dystopian feel to it, which I quite like. I thought uh, I, Company um, Flow's um, major or Co Flow, uh, mm-hmm. their major label debut was in 1997. <laughs> 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 Albeit they started in 1993, I believe. 
Yeah, you're right. Is that correct? Uh, sorry if I'm being a stickler. He was only 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's... Uh, he actually met uh, Mr. Len, the other uh, member, another member of um, Company Flow, uh, at his 18th birthday party. Really? So he was a young man back then. wonder what they were doing. Uh, they probably nothing to do with Pringles cans anyway didn't, didn't, they, off, <laughs> didn't they off you <laughs> no it wouldn't have been legally drinking in, that's you'd in be New down York. here in the first do you not do that when you got your you're like when you turned 18 you went so down not, to the off you were like I'll have some beer please I, but I mean I think in New York it's 21 right I don't know I went to the pub uh, and bought a pint and the guy well he actually gave me the pint for free and he was like oh, that's a legal one for you son because I've been going to that pub for about four years so. <laughs> <laughs> like, bless him thanks very much salt, of the, earth, <laughs> salt yep. of the earth up there and all Ness all Ness, all Ness not Alapool all Ness <laughs> yeah I mean I think one of the reasons I picked this record is not just because I think it's the best LP record I actually think it's probably can you say LP LP because LP best <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you have that one, Chris. On you go. I just had it. <laughs> um, no, I, I think not only is it the best LP LP, but I think I actually think it might be better than Run the Jewels. Really? Ooh. Mm-hmm. See, this is we come at hip hop from different angles. I feel my angle is very acute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's I was like, definitely like, looking at Mark. I mean, all three of us come at. Uh, I glanced the fuck off hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> it's like fifteen degrees, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I feel like I I came to hip hop basically from Lil Wayne and <laughs> okay, that, that makes sense. And <laughs> I like hip hop that ha- just has absolutely thundering bass, which this has, and an abundance, you know, aggressive stuff. And the first LP I ever had was actually from this record. It was uh, Full Retard track two. Which is a fucking great tune. Really, we do need to discuss later on. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a that's it's, a reference from a uh, reference from Tropic uh, Thunder. No, no, is it? You never go full retard. Oh yeah, it is from Tropic Thunder. Um, so like passing the buck then. Which is Robert Downey Jr. saying it as he says in blackface. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a level of meta and um, except this rapper, irony. This rapper's here. white though. He's good at that. He's really good at doing meta stuff. Um, Help, he's white. So it's a white man doing a black form of music, quoting a line from a white man in blackface. <laughs> A black form of music, yeah. I mean, black form of music that he was completely were, were really brought up in well. Brooklyn. So the Beastie Boys were black. This is, of course. This is yeah. well worn. Yeah, we talked. You about know, this. it is interesting though that of the hip hop records that Mark's nominated, a disproportionate number have been white. Oh, that is true. <laughs> Mark, yeah, well, Mark's I picked, obviously I picked, racist. I so. picked, <laughs> I've picked three, and two of them been white. So yeah. yeah. And what proportion of the hip hop community do you think is white? Probably a lot more than you think is. I think it's two thirds. <laughs> <laughs> I, no but that's what i'm getting at maybe is that uh i like hip-hop from a very black perspective yeah yeah as a black man myself yeah <laughs> i no i don't know i just i really like production that's like really booming and i i never came at it from like a traditional like public enemy yeah like tribe called quest all that stuff mm. I, you know the more the more funkier stuff that is obviously how it all began and that's what I find with this record, which we'll we'll talk about later. The production on it yeah. is it feels like an end point to traditional underground yeah, hip hop. Definitely like um you get a lot of the feel of like, the bomb squads mm-hmm. on LP stuff, you know, which is obviously where Public Enemy goes. Yeah, with the, you know, the live sample from. drums yeah. and stuff mm-hmm. like that is all very yeah. quite organic. This is like this is like the logical extension of that, mm-hmm. but with a lot more synth. Yeah. Which he plays a lot, you know. Um and I find that that's where that, that's where I like production, like it, sort of hip hop production. I like it to sound like the Bomb Squad, you know. I like it to sound like everything's peaking, everything's loud as fuck, you know. That's the kind of thing I really like. I like my hip hop production to just be sub and nothing else, <laughs> <laughs> literally nothing else. <laughs> um, I, I I have to say like, the the live drum sample stuff again is definitely appealing. That was one of the aspects of POS. There's a lot of organic stuff on this. Threw me in. Yeah, yeah, cool. absolutely. I mean, this starts mm-hmm. very organically right off the bat, so. I think that side of it, I, I find it much easier to warm to. Some of the stuff Dave likes, I find it harder to get into because it's just that production approach it doesn't really marry with my kind of more alternative rock sensibilities and this is just a little bit closer to a, a, a language that I speak. Yeah, so. I mean, LP is definitely, he clearly likes like rock music, you know, like it's throughout his entire career you can hear him having guests on his records who are, who are in rock bands and using guitars like, quite a lot and a lot of the stuff he does which is I think probably why I'm attracted to it as well but I mean his labels that he's run Def Jux and uh, Company Flow 
have always had a particular sort of sound to them. You know, obviously fairly diverse, but you know, uh, it's interesting. Do you know, it's inter- We should talk about uh, the, the records label stuff uh, has been what he was doing quite a lot of the time. Yeah, and mm-hmm. his record. He's obviously come to prominence through Run the Jewels, but it'd be interesting to go through his story because, yeah, yeah it's a weird so, one. I mean, as I understood it, it's what, like Company Flow parted ways with the record label, which is a major. That came out in 97, but it was largely as a result of uh, him falling out with them, I believe. But he was he was the main antagonist, and then they left that label, and that's when uh, Def Jux was started. Was started, mm-hmm. yeah. Or he's changed the name, right? Because you said he, he was prosecuted. Yeah, so it was originally called Def Jux and then they were sued by Def Jam in 2001. But it's not the same. There's at least two letters different. I know. Well, six. yeah, but it's, you know, it's a hip-hop record label and they're called DEF. What they were doing was a play on Def Jam. You yeah, know, obviously. We're going to be the underground That's stuff. fine. Yeah, I get it. And it's, I was just being facetious. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the irony from over here because there was a microphone in the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, then they had to ch- change it to Def and Definitive Jux. And that I, I always, I always like associate. Maybe it's because I heard, I've heard a few, I heard a few of the songs as well. On retrospect, now that I think about it, there's definitely some LP stuff and uh, some other hip hop artists like Aesop Rock and all that who were on like Tony Hawk's games. When I was growing up, and I'd heard them before. Yeah, he's produced them as well. Mm-hmm. So, like, I always associate kind of a lot of Def Chuck stuff with skate punk and stuff. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally. Mm. It was that sort of underground hip hop that was happening in the late 90s, early 2000s that was really alternative compared to, you know, the big stuff that was yeah, coming was like 50 from Cent like, and yeah, Eminem and all, that. and all that mm-hmm. shit. And that alternative hip hop was like, to be honest, it was more punk than, you know, punk yeah. rock necessarily was at that point. But also a lot of the same skate kids were getting into hip hop at the same time mm-hmm. as, you know, they would have traditionally been into punk. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's maybe where a lot more white people got involved as well because it was like this crossover of cultures. Mm-hmm. I think the Beastie Boys, well, the Beastie Boys probably did quite a large part of playing that as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's always been, there was, there always has been, especially even since back in the days of like cultural appropriation, the Beastie Boys and their music from moving quite quickly from punk and hardcore to being, you know, purebred hip hop, you know, taking that old style and basically ragging on it. But I can never really, I mean, I enjoy the Beastie Boys, don't get me wrong, but I can never really get fully on board with them because of the production. It yeah. was not quite as bombastic as Public Enemy, who I really, who I really love, you know. Aye. I, I actually, I like the later sort of Beastie Boys stuff. Um, it's odd given that Beastie Boys started as a punk band. Yeah. You know, you thought it would have been a bit more full on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of it was really tame. Uh, I actually, I like their sort of bigger 90s production stuff. Yeah. You know, All Nasty was a really good record. Mm-hmm. And they definitely get more towards being dancey, didn't they? Yeah. Which was, which was cool. I like that kind of stuff too. That's funny, like that sort of era of Beastie Boys, I think was influenced by British big beat stuff mm-hmm. that was coming out you know chemical, chemical brothers, brothers and stuff, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, so which is interesting stuff fits well that yeah because this record is actually i feel ha- pays a lot of attention to that sort of late 90s british dance music actually when we'll talk about it later yeah but it's a funny sort of cyclical thing maybe so let's i mean chris to talk about a little bit about co-flow so let's talk about about lp's career like he didn't really do a, a lot of rapping on the co-flow, re- co-flow record but he started doing Def Jocks and then he released his first record, Fantastic Damage, in 2002. 2002. Yeah. Yeah, Company Flow, I think, had split in 2001, mm-hmm. albeit amicably, but they, yeah. they'd already called it a day before he brought out his solo record. And Fantastic Damage is probably the one I think fans would say is, is maybe his best because it does have the old school hip hop sound, the samples, you know, the lots of break beats and stuff like that, but it's so fucking long, man. It's like 18 tracks, right? It's like an hour and 10 minutes long. And it's like a typical hip-hop record in that sense, you know? It, it, it takes a long time to get there. Like, I like the sound of that album. I just, uh, it was so hard to keep my attention. Yeah, but I find that as well. When I was well, hip hop albums get to a certain point, I find it really, I start my attention starts to just kind of fade off. Yeah, he's obviously got better at that throughout his career. And then I think the next one was High Water, right? Which is like an instrumental record with jazz band. Four. Yeah, which is oh, I think they believe the quote was 
it's one of the hardest things he ever had to do. But if it's going to be hard, he wants to do it, and he just mm. wants to push himself and working with. It's actually band. really it's interesting like, that record. Right, it's really interesting, yeah. And that kind of puts him in the same kind of space as like R no, R R G D two. Yeah. And stuff like that, like that actual. Who was on its label? Yeah. Like, um, like an instrumental hip hop producers. Yeah, and I think RJD2 is maybe one of those guys that's taken what DJ Shadow was doing and like mm-hmm. really expanded on it in a way that even DJ Shadow didn't, you know, after yeah. Uh, yeah. Private Press, yeah, his, yeah. his records got, you know, maybe went downhill. But there was a lot of artists that went out there like Cut Chemist and RJD2 that were doing really interesting things. And yeah, it is really interesting LP that he's really talented, you know, rapper and rhymer, but also totally forged his own way in production, mm. which is quite rare. I mean, the production stuff is like clearly his, his main focus in the 2000s, right? Mm-hmm. I kind of recognised a lot of the names, to be honest. Mm. It is much of a novice as I am. It was like Aesop Rock, you mentioned. Yeah. Preface, uh, Prefuse, sorry, 73. Mm-hmm. Atmosphere, uh, Del the Funky Homo Sapien. Yeah. And uh, Mers, 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 yeah. Mers, really good. Mars I don't actually know that one, but I've heard you guys talking about it. Before. Yeah, so the how that, f- you know, when we done a club night, I play felt. That's Mers. Yeah, that's, that's Mers and yeah, because uh, somebody jumped up and was yeah. really excited about it. That's Mers and uh, slog from atmosphere. She was only fifteen in love with bad R and B. She had to have vision because she saw the star in me. Encouraged me to write about the drama in my life. To most, I seemed strange, like something wasn't right. I used to fall a victim to the lunch. Um, Mars was on Def Jocks. In fact, he he kind of disappeared away into his own kind of hip hop thing away out in the West Coast and kind of moved away from that whole kind of scene. Like it's really weird because after when Def Jocks started to kind of kind of fall apart. Because they, they stopped doing stuff like in the mid two thousands almost, and LP almost like the glue they had a lot of these guys together. So like Atmosphere and Aesop Rock and and Cage and Yak Balls and all that, they would all be like mentioned in the same voice together. It's just funny when you're like yeah. quite sincerely saying those <laughs> names. <laughs> no, well, he's the man that brought butthole surface to the table. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> he set fire at people. <laughs> but then. When LP started focusing more on his own stuff, that whole scene kind of started to go its own separate directions. Aesop and all that stuff. I suppose they were also all as well. young musicians when they were starting out, and then they all sort of found their own voice. Yeah, they all world. gravitated towards each other and away from each other, but still kind of. Yeah. Like Aesop Rock worked with Rob Sonic, and Rob Sonic all sort with LP, and they did Hail Mary Mallon together. Great couple of records. And it's all kind of inspired by each other, which is pretty cool. He was doing a lot of like remix stuff as well, mm-hmm. wasn't he? So I mean, I, I know he'd done Beck, he'd done Dizzy Rascal, Nine Inch Nails, TV and the Radio. I mean, you're like you're, Head Automatica and stuff as well. You're going into Nexus territory here. Oh, well, that's okay. We can brush past it if you okay, like. Okay, yeah. I think we can go back to Nexus in a yeah. little while. What's um, Handsome Boy Modeling School? I, they were uh, Dan the Automator. Gorilla's who, guy. Yeah, Gorilla's yeah. guy. And Prince Paul. Prince Paul. Is that the guy from De La Soul? Uh, yes, and Great. a few other things. Grave diggers. Um, I recognise these names. Yeah, they just did a couple of uh, records, and I remember. Um, it was the first one that he did it with Alec Empire, didn't he? Of Atari Teenage Riot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the second just, one he did with Chino Moreno. Yeah, they had a lot. Of, uh, LP did his collab on that. It was just a very a couple of very collaborative albums that uh, those two put together. Um, Is that like a whole se- series, Handsome Boy Modeling School? Well, it was two albums and a couple of singles. Okay. Um, the first record, uh, So How's Your Girl, late 90s, I think, 1999. Actually, a really, really good record. Kind of Avalanches-esque. I feel like I always associate them with avalanches, like right, really okay. sample heavy. Yeah. But quite interesting. They brought a lot of folk in. Uh, DJ Shadow was involved. Uh, Mike D, Alec Empire, and LP did their track. Um, I think Sean Lennon was actually on a track as well. So. Back in Alec Empire, I, I saw Atari Teenage Riot live once and it was on 
1999 at Reading Festival. The same year that uh, Offspring, Fun Loving Criminals, and Terror Vision played the main stage. <laughs> Goodness me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Red, Hot, Red Hot Chili Peppers finished proceedings, but I was in a tent watching Pennywise absolutely rip it up. Obviously, you get down to the festival the night before and you get absolutely shit faced because that's just what you do. We're at a festival. Can't wait to crack things open. Also, loads of really, really embarrassing stories from that. But <laughs> the first act at 11 a.m., Fucking 11am was like Atari Empire. Teenage Riot. And like, <laughs> like, unbelievable. Like, what are you doing to us, man? Like, like, you sleep next to... Oh, it was just... Go! And I went to see it because you couldn't avoid it. Like in the tent, you were as well going up and sitting in front of it. I just, oh God, it was so shrill and brutal and abrasive. And you talk about sub, fucking hell. Mm -hmm. They utilise all frequencies. Yeah, we didn't. At the same time. <laughs> and, and all beats. We didn't need the help of the brown note. Half of us were fine the brown notes without even meaning to. Um, and the, oh, the girl's voice was just, oh, good God. Anyway, sorry. Tangent. Not a fan then. <laughs> <laughs> I actually kind of liked them. I mean, they take themselves way too seriously. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was a spectacle. But Jesus, don't put a tarry teenage riot on at eleven a.m. Yeah, yeah, I find I, I think that's quite bad planning. Yeah. What happened to Alec Empire anyway? Somebody the other day told me he died, but I checked the day no, he, he played uh, a tarry teenage riot. Played doing the rabbit hole this summer. Oh, wait. Aye, maybe that's what it meant when he died. They just thought his career's <laughs> dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, apparently they were pretty good. Is, is still doing the a member break that there's, exceptionally f one, fast and loud one member of that band's dead I'm sure one of the guys died yeah I think the other guy died because there's the two girls and the two two guys yeah, I really liked Atari Teenage right and they were always you know but really you, you liked Psycho and you liked a lot of that kind of no, stuff no fuck off and they were always like <laughs> they were like this sort of anarchist you know left wing anti-fascist drum and bass futuristic band that they John Swedish Pe uh, no they were German German. Digital hardcore. And digital digital hardcore. hardcore. Like they started the label. Yeah, mm. that's a fucking great name for uh, everything. <laughs> uh, and porn, especially. <laughs> yeah, John Peel loved them. I, I, that's how I got into them. I think was listening to John Peel's festive fifty. I was always putting on some Atari Teenage Riot. Okay, they were interesting. Point. I think uh, I'm pretty sure the guy that died was called Carl Crack. <laughs> so uh, I died of a drug overdose. But maybe it was Irish crack. Maybe he's a really fun guy. It's like, what's that guy? <laughs> Happy, what's his name from uh, Turbo Negro? Oh, Happy uh, Tom. Happy Tom. So maybe Carl Crack is like, oh, top of the morning to you, Carl <laughs> Crack. <laughs> no, I think Carl <laughs> Crack is like the opposite of nominative determinism. You know, where you get a job or, you know, something happens to you because you have your name. <laughs> well, it's not the opposite of it. Maybe that is literally the definition of it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, rest in peace, Carl Crack. Uh, I'll tell you, Tina's right. Still alive. There we go. Hi guys, it's just me putting in here to ask for some cash. You see, we have some technical issues. That was the sound of my headphones breaking. We need to buy some new headphones. We also need to buy another microphone because we have guests on sometimes and we also need to pay for things like, you know, hosting and all that. Now, I know this is like a big bag and saying, can you give us some money? And it'd be really nice if you could uh, because we do new stuff. But it would also be really nice if you could just furnish us with your attention and your friend's attention. So ask a friend to listen. Share it and tag us if you can. But even if you don't, even if you just like say, oh, pal, look, here's an episode. Have a listen. You might dig it. We would also really appreciate that. Also, as Chris said last week, we're looking into alternate ways of funding this. So right now we're using PayPal donations, but we understand that that may be a bit cumbersome for some people. So if you've got any suggestions on how else we could fund it, be it, you know, like Indiegogo or Patreon or whatever, then please just drop us a line and we can, we can talk about it. Thanks. Um
Um, but yeah, I I mean there were some interesting records released on um, Def Jocks. Def Jocks. Yeah, there's some really good ones. Um, a few of Aesop Rock's good records are on there. No, uh, the woman no regrets on it. What's it called? Um, I, the none shall pass. Yeah, no, the one before that. Oh, I I can't. I don't know if I know that record. It's great. Uh, Bazooka really Tooth. Great. No, that's the one after. I'm not sure. Oh, I fuck, I don't know. <laughs> hey okay. guys, I don't, oh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to give you the answer. I want you to find out yourself. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I, Labor, I really Labor, like Labor Days. I really like Nunch Shall Pass. Nunch Shall Pass was good. Labor Days was, was my introduction to to Aesop Rock. Um, and then he 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 started doing production as well. So and he kind of got more and more electronic as he went on to. I think he did a lot of production. He did production on that Felt record, which is. Um, protagon- it's got protagonist on it Felt 3 mm-hmm. It was really really good Really heavy sounding um, And then RGD2 uh, Dead Ringer by the way We were talking about that Just an absolute masterpiece of a record Really really good record I think it might come up as A yeah. unsung record at one point Because it's got some amazing tracks on it Yeah It's really well defined record It's, it's got, got a, lot of, a lot of fucking like uh, Orchestral stuff on it too which Yeah is just And I think it's been beautiful. Incredibly overlooked I think it's probably Been very influential as well But yeah And then of course He released a couple of his own records On it as well Fantastic Damage And I'll Sleep When You're Dead I'll Sleep When You're Dead Which like I said Was in contention for this for I me, really like that record That's a really good record And that's 2007 Yeah that's kind of when he started to move more towards like being more organic as a as like a I guess a composer right um, it's got some of my favourite tunes on it like Smithereens is great Tasmanian Pain is really really good too Tasmanian what? Tasmanian Pain <laughs> <laughs> That what that's what it's called, right? Yeah, it's yep. t- a mini pink lifter, yeah. <laughs> Trent Reisner's on this record. Yeah, he's on Cat Flying Power. T- Flying Tology, yeah. Flying a Dower Prolimbo's Chris is up. nodding his head He's like oh, I know those people <laughs> I do know those people Those people are Not hip hoppers <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where So is he yeah. um, Daryl Palumbo's on it as well He's on the Overly over- Dramatic Truth I think he's just doing Backing vocals Is that keyboards. Head of Dramatic again? Maybe this thing isn't wrong Maybe you should lay right there Put your hands up in the air If you want time Make me be Trying to spare you Trying to be God melodic Man on fire How we long gone the sire Fuck you raw now yeah, class jaw, class jaw. Well, head, head automatica again. Yeah. United Nations because he well. remixed head automatica. No, no, he did a yeah, he did, he did. LP, LP, LP did. Or yeah. I thought he meant Daryl. I was like, no, he's not that bad. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've many a time loosened my top button to beating heart, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's got. I don't mean my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the most unnecessary key change in any song ever. Do you think? Oh yeah, you're like two <laughs> thirds the, the way point. through, and then. <laughs> that is the point of key changes. Yeah. They're completely gratuitous. It's like love really hurts without you, and God gave rock and roll to you, and, and living on a prayer, <laughs> living on a prayer, and which is God knows how he gets up there, and doesn't anymore, her, baby. <laughs> Have you heard them? <laughs> <laughs> I can't be at this. Yeah, but yeah, he can't, fav- be, he can't be any worse live than Marilyn Manson is now. Oh man, I feard I he's pretty fucking bad I've live. Seen it. it is so bad, like so bad. <laughs> Anyway, don't stray into this territory just to humour me, guys. Carry on. And the Overly Dramatic Truth, I think, is possibly my favourite LP song. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's a really, really good tune. Uh, just the whole sort of creepy composition of it and subject matter, all about relationship stuff. is really, really good. Always loved that song. Uh, Flying Tology is great. Trent Reznor's sound on that. You can see where that's where Trent's getting a lot of his... Uh, you can see that's where... That's what you call him Jamie now. <laughs> I can see that's for... Oh, you might actually point out that this guy's yeah. name's Jelly, 
Jelly. <laughs> Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact that you guys didn't even know that. This guy's name's Jamie Milline. Yeah. Milline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, it references, it's, it, I don't know, like, it's just a name, right? LP. Like, he doesn't take it seriously. He always calls himself Jamie when he's talking and stuff. It's really good. I like it. I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, he always refers to himself in the third person. Yeah. Hi, Jamie. Believe I, that. Hi, Jamie. Believe this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, and a lot of a lot of the running Joe stuff specifically is always Jamie and stuff as opposed to LP, um, which he used to used to use LP quite a lot on some of his other records. But I don't know. Maybe he's grown up a bit. Anyways, um, but no, I'll sit me your dead as a as a as a properly good record, and it, it came very close for me. But then, as a, as a great love run the Jews, which was don't get me wrong, I happened quite quickly. I started to come when I came back to this record. I started listening to it more. I now listen to this record regularly. Cancer for Cure. It's one of my favorite records. Um, I think it's I think it's amazing. It is a good album. We we dropped a lot of names there. Do you want to do the Nexus? We should do the Nexus yeah. because I want to talk about this record soon, and also a couple of records that aren't this record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah. I mean, it, it should be pretty easy to get a Nexus going. <laughs> it's almost too easy. That's kind of why I took the hard way around. But it's going to be worth it. Yeah. So, Fritz. better Fritz. Fritz. It's the Unsung Podcast. Dave Grohl Nexus. Need to find a way to connect the show to that guy. For playing in the farm. Some podcasts, they grow nexus. Don't take too long. All right, you guys ready? Are you ready? Here we go. I like I just like the phrase a bit of Fritz. I'm gonna start using that in normal conversation just when something is, I don't know, spicy or a bit seductive and sexy. Oh, a wee bit of Fritz, sir. He's really getting his money's worth, isn't he? Well, you know. You should be getting royalties for fucking, that. No, yeah. We should be getting royalties for that. Anyway. So who's going first here? Who's got the uh do you want to go direct? I'll go direct. Right, let's go direct. I'll give you I'll give you a Plethora of options. <laughs> All right, yeah, okay. So I think they worked there. Plethora. Um, plethora. 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 <laughs> you should never laugh at a person who doesn't know how to say a word properly because it means they read it and didn't say it. That like. is true. He th- has a degree <laughs> in words. <laughs> but the just words. Not, but I just know not, the words. Just not in saying them. <laughs> I've read many words. <laughs> <laughs> I know them. Uh, yeah. So, the electric cat power's on. Um, uh-huh. I'll assume you're dead and she... Dave Grohl played one of our records, so there's a direct right there. Okay. Is that is that your final answer? Uh, we got a better one. There's also Trent Reznor. He's on Flytology. Yeah, that's true. Um, and Dave Grohl played drums for Nine Inch Nails. Um, Matt Sweeney, who plays guitar on a lot of LP's records, plays has played guitar in Queen's of Stone Age. Dave Grohl was also in Queen's of Stone Age. Um, yeah, there's lots of options. Danny Brown can go via there, which we did a couple of weeks ago. With Rusty does all really Zach Della Rocker. And run the jewels. Oh yeah, we didn't mention that, but um, LP and DJ Shadow were chosen to work on Zach De La Roche's record that didn't come out. Yeah, yeah, that's really weird. That yeah, never appeared. Yeah, mm-hmm. just weird. And he dropped one track from that. I think it was March of uh, March of Death, mm-hmm. and then he did another track a couple of years ago, which was the LP produced one, and it was really really good. Uh, that record that he did put out, uh, One Day as a Lion, was actually really good. Yeah, that's, that's him and what was the drummer? The drummer was in the Mars Wall. Uh, yeah, John Theodore. Yeah, and it's just him and. It's just him and John. He plays the key. He plays the the, the road organ on it as well. But yeah, there's any number of ways you can get to Dave Grohl via LP, which is really not difficult at all. Any number of boring ways. Yeah, there's yep. only so many interesting ways. Dave's got one. I've got a quite an easy one. We've talked about him a lot. Alec Empire from mm-hmm. Atari Teenage Riot. <laughs> it's this isn't too long, but it features an album that maybe we will feature on a mixtape. Good stuff. At some point, uh, Atari Teenage Riot did our song with Slayer. Oh, uh, which appeared on the Spawn soundtrack. Ooh, Spawn, yeah. a terrible movie. 
back when you know before they were putting Children. proper money and proper success into uh, comic book movies, they allowed them to make this. Uh, it's so funny as well that the little black farting monster in that that John Leguizamo played. John Leguizamo is now doing a series on like, <laughs> Latin American history <laughs> on Netflix. Yeah, we a weird film, but um, you know back when a comic book or superhero film was allowed to just be. Yeah. F- a medium budget Todd McFar- 18 he's bound to get that made again he's been trying so you know, with very actual hard money. he's been trying so hard um, to get it made recently but that was a really interesting record that came out because th- what they did was they got a lot of uh, metal and rock bands to team up with a producer or a hip hop artist and I remember there was Marilyn Manson and the Sneaker Pimps which are really I, it was actually an interesting track Corn uh, and the Dust Brothers, um, Metallica, uh, DJ Spooky. There was like a drum and bass version of For Whom the Bell Tolls. Butthole Surfers did a track with Moby. Uh, it's all coming back. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tom Morello did a track with The Prodigy. There was a couple of shit ones as well. Incubus. We <laughs> a couple of shit ones. After that list, there was a couple of shit. <laughs> uh, but there was one, Henry Rollins uh, and Goldie. That's right, yeah. You know, which is two people you wouldn't think would ever meet. Uh, but they did a track called T4 Strain and it was actually pretty interesting and I actually found a video of Henry Rollins uh, at the 930 Club 30th anniversary in Washington DC in 2010 introducing Dave Grohl on stage to come and play Everlong so that exists that's, that's and pretty, Dave Grohl is Dave Grohl that's pretty great actually so yeah that's my, that's that's my nexus yeah. but it allowed me to talk about the Spawn soundtrack yeah and that's been shortlisted for a mixtape on best soundtracks I yes believe. yeah who's up for a wee bit of terrorism <laughs> oh, oh it's been too long <laughs> LP aka Jemmy J- Jelly Molina <laughs> <laughs> was in The Weathermen mm-hmm. that's another project that he never really got anywhere because of Kamatau dying but yeah and The Weathermen were named after Weathermen mm-hmm which was a revolutionary leftist organisation uh, from the 60s and 70s formed at the Ann Arbor campus of Uni of Michigan, I believe. Now, I didn't actually know a lot about Weathermen and so I've had to sort of investigate it, but basically they embarked on an internal campaign of war against the United States because of its uh, imperialist uh, tendencies and its use of foreign wars to enrich itself. And yeah, so in 1970, they kind of formally declared the state of war against the USA. They sided with a lot of like Black Panther groups, uh, anti-Vietnam War groups. Very, it was, they were one of the first groups to really publicize the notion of uh, white privilege as well. Uh, they embarked on a thing called the Days of Rage, during which there were multiple bombings against government buildings and things like banks. No civilians were actually killed during that campaign, although three members of the group itself died when in an accidental explosion, which it seems likely that perhaps a bomb that was getting made malfunctioned. They also at one point bombed the women's toilets of the Pentagon. That's just fair. Yeah, it's like, it's strange to think that somebody was bombing the Pentagon toilets and I'd never heard of this mm-hmm. this thing. Um, it's been weirdly airbrushed out of history, this whole movement, because it is really interesting. Strange, yeah. You know, radical left-wing action in the States. Another thing they did was in 1970 or thereabouts, they broke Timothy Leary out of jail. Uh, they were apparently paid $20,000 by uh, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, who were apparently the leading like psychedelic uh, lobby group in the United States at the time. But they busted out Timothy Leary, he of altered states fame, and him and his wife were taken to Algeria, where they stayed for a while. Uh, now, there's a, a little aside, there's a bit of a rumour that the payment was actually made by either an unnamed but very prominent female folk singer of the time, or apparently it was traced and the name of the organisation was linked to something John Lennon was involved in. I think it was named after his backing band or something, and it, it traced back to something that was named, had the same name. And actually John Lennon, um, part of the attempt to extradite him by the American government was because of him donating to various organisations that were prescribed at the time and him donating to anti-war groups and things that they just generally, especially people like J. Edgar Hoover didn't like. But anyway, yeah. Timothy Leary is the next link. He, uh, when he came back, uh, wanted to try and break into the mainstream. He embarked on a whole bunch of like spoken word tours, even though he never really made it big because obviously 
the, the USA in the 1980s is very puritanical. You had the satanic panic and they were trying to clamp down on drugs. Um, Most dangerous man in America. Yeah. According to Nixon. There you go. But he did actually get some pretty prominent celebrity friends in the, in the 80s, including John Fishanti, which could have been one uh, link. But another was David Byrne of Talking Heads, born in Edinburgh. No, born in Dumbarton. Born in Dumbarton. Well, maybe he was born in Edinburgh, but he was brought up in Dumbarton. Yeah. And... David Byrne of Talking Heads also wrote the score and performed in the film This Must Be the Place by Paolo Sorrentino. Mm -hmm. Really, really excellent film in which the actor Sean Penn basically plays a kind of detective version of Robert Smith trying to track down an ex-Nazi. Now, Sean Penn has a number of notable qualities and activities, one of which was beating up Madonna. Uh, the other was he was married to Robin Wright until uh, 95, I think. And uh, as he split up from Robin Wright, he hooked up with the singer Jewel, who he'd seen performing on Conan O'Brien, and he then kind of followed her tour around, uh, hanging out with his new girlfriend, uh, Jewel. You could say he ran the Jewel. Oh, <laughs> nice. Hey, Taking it back. That's the kind of professional touch that this podcast needs <laughs> to get much, to the guess. next level. Jewel played herself in the movie Walk Hard, starring John C. Riley. And if you haven't seen Walk Hard, sort your fucking life out, because it's amazing. There were a number of other links, actually, from that film. The most obvious was probably Eddie Vedder was in Walk Hard as Eddie Vedder. Eddie Vedder from Seattle, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I went the Jack Black route, because it allowed me to just observe the scene where Jack Black plays Paul McCartney. <laughs> 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 which is really a pretty good scene and Jack Black of Tenacious D Dave Grohl played the devil in the video for Tenacious D ergo Dave Grohl ergo Nexus complete I'll give you that one yep well done thanks I mean we I put a lot more effort into the Nexus than I did listen to LP <laughs> <laughs> but it meant we got to talk about terrorism for a while so I'm happy with that yeah mm -hmm. good stuff and everybody learned something everybody so learned something Weatherman you should look it up because somehow uh, it has not been mentioned enough. I think it's been, there's a few films where synonymous groups are, are mentioned and, you know, the whole idea of a militant terrorist group exists in the background. But, yeah, you never really just hear about it actually existing and, the, you know, what they did. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we yeah. should do another podcast about American militant left-wing history. I'd be into yeah. that. Like literally a different podcast. A different podcast. <laughs> the American leftist militants and, well, we could and the do, tunes they whistled. We could do a different <laughs> podcast chain about unsung militant Melting groups. <laughs> groups. That could be good. A bit of Fritz then. Yeah. Well, a little bit of Fritz. Let's add a little bit of Fritz into yeah. the proceedings. All right, you guys ready? Are you ready? Here we go. So yeah, 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 well, just before we talk about this album itself, it just came out in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. he, he met Killer Mike. Killer Mike and formed Run the Jewels, and it was 2013 they started doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just actually divert and say, I didn't realise they were introduced by that guy Jason DeMarco from Adult Swim. Yeah, that's how, yeah, that's basically... So <laughs> that's fucking amazing. That's how, they, that's how they met, because I think Killer Mike was looking for producer for his records, and he suggested the LP. And then that's how it happened. Do you watch Adult Swim? I've seen a few things in Adult Swim, yeah. Adult Swim is amazing. Yeah. Like, especially the older era of Adult Swim where they bought up a bunch of cheap Hanna-Barbera cartoons and recut Harvey Birdman them. Attorney at Law is the best thing Harvey ever. Birdman Attorney at Law, uh, including, like, the, the Flintstones Mafia, <laughs> Scooby-Doo, where they're drug addicts. Uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, it's brilliant. Oh, and the C-Lab nice, 2021 man. as well. C-Lab 2021 is insane. Did you get that thing I sent you? <laughs> Bizarro, <laughs> uh, and uh, oh, there's is Space Ghost Coast to Coast. Uh, yeah, Space is, Ghost is fucking. Bizarre, they man. interview so, like Metallica and Tom York <laughs> and all kinds of things on this fake cartoon talk uh, show. Anyway, so I love I thought so. Uh, so they introduced him, and he produced Killer Mike's sixth album. Rap is that music, right? Rap yeah. music. Yeah. Fifth. So Killer Mike's also on one of the tracks in this album. Yeah, he's well, on right? Tougher Code of Killer. So. Do you think that if he hadn't started Run the Jewels, the LP would have used some of this material for his own career? Because I know it's like Run the Jewels sort of takes over mm -hmm. 
from this point on, doesn't it? Yeah, it has taken over, yeah. Well, it's interesting, mm-hmm. like, R.A.P. Music, which stands for Rebellious African People, and Cancer for Cure came out in the Was same... A week, a week later, uh, Cancer for Cure came out a week after rap music, or mm-hmm. all the way around. And I think, basically, what happened was they just worked out that they worked well together. Good friends, uh, you know, had the same sort of politics, had the same sort of ideals about music industry. Killer Mike really dug LP's production. So, yeah, it just seemed kind of like a ideal situation for them both, where they were like, fuck it, let's just like make a super group, basically. Join forces. Um, it would be interesting what would have happened if they'd never met. Yeah. I don't really know. Because, um, I mean, the turnaround on the Run the Jewels project has been like rapid, right? They're writing and recording stuff quicker than either of them have really done in their career, particularly LP, you mm-hmm. know. It was, what, 2007 was when I'll Sleep When You're Dead came out, and then that's what, that's what record was 2012. Yeah. And then there's been three records since then. Yeah, it seems like they've really right pushed now. themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, the two of them have really inspired each other. And Maybe that's the thing as well, though. If you're only responsible for your own projects, the, 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 the ability to procrastinate or to overproduce or to go back to the drawing board or to start again is yeah. there. Whereas if someone else is there going, no, man, this is really good, maybe it kind of helps keep you on track a little bit. Yeah. You get too lost in your own head. The other they're way. on an indie label. They're on Fool's Gold. Um, all their stuff is released for free online. So there's like, the fact that they've got so big so quickly through those kind of means is pretty incredible, to be mm. honest. But I think that they hit at a really sweet spot in terms of hip-hop music coming to the mainstream, but the sort of alternative mainstream Pitchfork kids, you know, getting into it and, you know, a lot of really interesting artists, everybody from, you know, Kendrick Lamar to like Danny Brown, embracing multiple genres. And I think, you know, beyond traditional hip hop and traditional hip hop production, you know, I think rap music, R.E.P. music by Killer Mike is his best work. Definitely, yeah. I think it came out at exactly the right time. Yeah, I think uh, they really helped each other blossom. And I think that the world was sort of waiting for a, a big hip hop band that were putting out really banging tunes that were politically aware, had a sense of humour. It's interesting that like, Killer Mike gets asked on shows like Bill Maher and stuff like that. Mm. So it's not they're not just a musical group, they're valued for their insight as well. Killer Mike's always been an activist. That's that was, like that's always been his big deal because if he's Georgia, he's always been really really heavily involved he's in, kinda, in activism. He's controversial as well though. I mean he, yeah, he, he 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 put some noses out of joint with some of his comments at some point. I mean uh, he's he's an advocate for the NRA. Well he's not an advocate the NRA, but he's yeah. a, he's a gun know, owner. He supports the NRA but yeah. But he has, comes at that from a working class black background. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, yeah. I, I've got, I, I know somebody who who is from Mobile, Alabama, and um, her dad was saying he used to be an army, and he's like not pro gun, but he's like I'm actually thinking about getting a gun because the biggest army in the fucking world is mobilized right now. You know, what I mean, they've got guns, and, and there's lots of gangs as well that have guns. So I think from a community perspective, or for black people. I can see why it makes sense, right? Well, his his it's argument, logical. as far as I've been able to see in his interviews, is more that he's worried about the police coming to his house to shoot him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that's and, exactly and, what I'm saying. So, like, that's yeah. what that guy was saying. It's like, the biggest arm in the world is, like, the guns and the mobilised. It's a police force, you know what I mean? They could come mm-hmm. down at any time. I mean, yeah. it's very well for us, you know, left-wing white liberals in a uh, de-gunned society to say guns are bad. But, you know, when you are a minority in a highly weaponized state... And, you know, that's the sort of thing that he's, yeah, he's but, talking about. I mean, about, so. if you looked at the numbers, you'd see that the chances of his kids killing themselves accidentally using his gun are far higher than the chances of the police kicking in his front door and shooting him. He used to be a dealer as well. So, I mean, he's probably coming from that perspective too. You know, he knows... It's still pretty stupid. He knows those are bad men because he's from Atlanta, Georgia, you know. It's still pretty but stupid. But it's an interesting perspective. I, 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 I'm not saying... Like, I, statistically, it's stupid. Yeah, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but I mean... I mean, are you, if the police do it. come to his house to kick, him, kick the door and then kill I'm him, more like does he think he's got a gun? Is he going to like save his life or is he going to murder a policeman and then end up being shot? There's actually a song but about that and is it the second on the Jules record? Or the third one? It's basically the whole narrative is him saying about if, if cops come to his house and take him away and all that. And Yeah, and meanwhile he's got the added incentive of his kid accidentally fucking about with his weapons in his house. Mm. I, I just I don't buy it. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about, but... um. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 I like the guy. I mean, he's he's a very entertaining and enjoyable guy to listen to on politics. I just uh, that side of it is just it doesn't add up whatsoever. Mm, completely agree. But it, it does come from an activist background, so which is why he gets asked talking to those shows quite a lot because yeah, he's, yeah. oh, he speaks well. Yeah, he, yeah. Mm. And he's on this record as well. When I when I had never heard Killer Mike before this record, and when I heard that the, the, how many people were going to be working together, I was like, 
haven't heard him in that song, it's so much, it makes so much sense. I think, see, if you listen to Run the Jewels, I don't want to talk about Run the Jewels too much, but I think when you listen to them, it's really, really easy for the, the humour of it to get lost completely because everything's so dark. But, I mean, that's on that song, Tough Quote the Killer, you yeah. know, like when, he, when Killer Mike first pops in. It's just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, yeah, R.A.P. music is something that needs to be talked about as well because I really love that record. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you chose Cancer for Cure. But I, I really, really, I do really like this record. I'd be interested to hear what Chris thinks as a non-hip hopper. Um, I, I like this album, actually. I was like, I like it more than I liked Sage Francis. Mm. Uh, I don't like it quite as much as I like P.O.S., but it was sort of in there. I had more of the P.O.S. vibe. I liked it because it was a little bit harder. Production's cool. Um, the instrumentation's good. I like his use of synths, actually. That really yeah. works for me. Mm-hmm. That That's a component that it, it's prominent enough. I would I would actually probably have liked it to be even more prominent, but that's just my sensibilities. But the bits where it, it pokes out were the bits that I like the best. And I think the moments in the songs that I've kind of made notes of, a lot of them were actually, I didn't know what it was about it that was immediately clicking. But then when I went back to it, it was because there was a part that had come in generally in the synth, either low or high. It was just it was just expanding the whole thing yeah like adding an extra dimension to it and i think he used that well i would as i say i would have quite liked to have seen it used even more generously that's just my own perspective well, the Jews is a lot more synth heavy all three records are a lot more synth heavy well, I, I listened to a fair bit of that as well i was listening to that when you guys got here tonight and i do i do like that there's a, there's a lot to get through I think on first hearing, I think I like the second record the best. Probably is the best one, I'd say. Yeah, I think it's the one with the the most f- bangers. Yeah. Like, really, you uh-huh. know, it's like the you could play pretty much any song of that in a club, maybe apart from the last one, and yeah. it, would, it would just go down so yeah. well. There's a few in this that I thought I can imagine they DJ really, really well. Mm. It's thick and it's aggressive and it's there's ener- a lot of energy, lot of energy in it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the kind of music that you're not relying on familiarity to get the crowd going because that's that thing. Sometimes when you drop a tune and it's familiar, people are into it because it's familiar. But other times, the actual sound of a tune, even if it's fairly new. And still be enough to keep things bouncing because it's got just an innate sort of yeah, just just it's got an innate energy. I totally agree with that. Um, I think that that's the the thing I prefer about this over "I Sleep When You're Dead" is this does have a lot more life to it. Yeah, I like that record, but it's quite I don't know. Yeah, it's quite one dimensional, maybe, mm-hmm. or yeah, it doesn't quite have the vibrancy that this yeah. record has. This is definitely motivated by grief. This whole record, though, as well. Mm-hmm. You know, with Kamal Tao dying and all that, with, I- with Kamal dying and stuff. Kamu Tao dying and all that. I thought know. the themes in this, I, I thought the guy was totally into his sci fi. He so really I, is, he totally is. Re- you know, he's yeah. a big Philip K. Dick fan, mm-hmm. George Orwell, Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> Supposedly, name check like Deep Space Nine, Star Trek series mm-hmm. and stuff. He that. always does that kind of thing. Um, you can, I, I think that's where he gets his dystopian kind of feel for his, his synth stuff from as well. It's definitely Blade Runner vibes, you know, like okay. Vangelis score stuff. Yeah. And yeah, Drones Over Brooklyn, you know, there's loads of sci-fi references and all of this Drones stuff Drones Over Bo- Brooklyn could easily, though, that could be an Obama reference, you know what I mean? Because this is 2012, this came out, yeah. and that was like peak fucking drone scandal for well, It's actually interesting because he wrote the song two years before the record um, was recorded, or before it was finished recording, so it was before all that stuff came out, and he was just writing about it because he smoked a pound of weed and he was super fucking paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole drone thing came out and it became quite prescient at that point. Um, I, I do actually think that's probably one of the best dancey tunes in mm-hmm. terms of like being able to drop it and get mm-hmm. keep a dance floor moving. It, it had a real groove to it. Yeah, I really liked the way as well, just the way the vo- the Vox and that 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 song specifically started just momentarily like a phone effect, and then yeah. slipped out into like full production. It mm-hmm. was it was cool. Yeah, interesting. If we're going through it, it's funny. Um, as mentioned, I think a request denied. It's it's interesting that it sounds so. Chemical Brothers were the big influence that yeah. I heard there. No 
knowing Run the Jewels and you know how progressive that is, and also you know the sort of hip hop that was happening at the same time, it's a sort of you know bit of a throwback, a throwback, yeah, uh, to that sort of big nineties production. It's a really long intro, isn't it? It is, right, yeah. Record, yeah. yeah. That um, the, that snare thing though, that was the bit that reminded me of the POS, or the sample. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool, man. When that comes in like a halfway through, it's like it kind of opens it up weirdly. Yeah, this is for me the thing is the thing that stuck out most about it was the bomb squad style production because it is just hard and heavy on the drums, you know. And that's yeah, like, it's, that's what they it's did. It's very percussion led. Yeah, and I don't have a problem with that actually at all. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's what adds a lot of the energy to it. Your only note is more sub. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know when. Did this come out? 2012. Yeah. So yeah, about five or six years ago was basically when I started getting into really heavy hip hop. And I had at least two tracks from this were on this playlist that I was educating myself about sort of heavy, heavy um, hip hop. Uh, the Full Retard would, was one that yeah. I played a lot. It's a, it's a really, really good track. How do we feel about that title? We are right well, it's got context. It's not about, you know. Anyway, um, The Full Retard, uh, it's a big tune. Yeah, it's a total banger. Yeah, and that squelchy th- that squelchy th- synth is really good too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I love it. And the pitched out vocal sample that's Camo Tao, I think. Mm. That pump the shit like in the future, which is taken directly from King of Hearts, I think, from the record, which was really which was record. I think that was released the same year or the year after this, even though it was like recorded, even though he died two thousand and six. So his death, his death from cancer, is a huge obviously plays on the title of the record. The whole thing is inspired by. I just even de- dedicated to him because it's like one of his best pals. So the whole thing's the whole record's undercut with this like well of like overcoming grief and, and the darkness and the self destruction that he kind of went under like undertook after he died. What do you think about work every time? Don't make me suffer this dimension straight. When we can bend face, let space pixelate. Sixty dollars for a newborn you. Yeah. Pay no attention to these savages. They don't own true faith. Pay no attention to the man behind this glass. Do you know what my favourite part of it is? Mm. It's got an airplane reference in it. <laughs> oh, really? It's got a lyric, it uh, looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. Yeah, oh, it does have that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. Is on the first line? Uh, first line in the second verse, yeah. I think. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, any airplane reference in any song is yep. I'm down with. Lloyd Bridges? Yes. <laughs> That's him. Yeah. The man from Airplane. But that's like I said, like the, the humor gets lost because everything sounds so dark. Yeah. But there's always lots of there's it. There's lots of it. He is. Jewels. That's another thing is you kind of forget, you know, he's a really great producer, but he's got some really interesting, like, and funny lines. He's mm. a, yeah, a really good lyricist. We spoke about drones over Rogan. Oh, he all knows great. That was the first time I ever heard Danny Brown. <laughs> Yeah, it was very early. Danny Brown. I can't remember when did uh, when did XXX come out. My favorite thing about that song is when Danny Brown comes in because like that's when the beat totally changes and it like, slows right down and he just like jumps. Yeah, it sort of his... sort of fade, the, the the BPM sort of fades. Yeah, I think Danny Brown's debut had come out just before that, like the year before, or XXX had come out before, but it was about the same time that. I'd, first heard his stuff yeah uh and his voice is just it's so stand out yeah, it's I just wild. <laughs> um and it works really well on this track i just I, I would love to do a danny brown episode at some point as well i can see chris is really enthused by that <laughs> and then we've talk, spoken about tougher called the killer like killer mate just fucking rips it apart <laughs> And you I like the synth in that one. Yeah. And there's like the, the synth's changing the root note underneath that works well. He's really he's a really clever like uh, composer, right? Like he does he does a lot. That's that's definitely the more kind of cinematic thing coming out in him, I think. You can hear that like with high water and stuff as well when he does instrumental stuff. Like all the all the run the jewel stuff, you can get his instrumental records too. And there's an instrumental version of this as well. And a lot of producers, a lot of hip-hop producers re- re- will release that if they're like super like into the production and the, and the composition of it. I didn't know that. Mm. Hey, oh, well, true story is yeah. angry. Hope in the throes, copa choking the holes, pokers roasting the coals, misanthropic and cold. In the world, go, 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 go,
Yeah, <laughs> he's, you know, he's, there's not much humor in that song. No, there's not. But it's good. It's a good. It's a really good tune, and um, the beat is just the beat and the bass womp is just like properly mm. like kicking you in the fucking face, man. I love it. Sounds like I've written here. It sounds like the whole world's under attack from aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, it's kind of aiming for that. Um, I thought the track eight, the jig is up. Mm-hmm. I thought that was one of the best ones. I really like the synth stuff in that again. Really dissonant. Tell me who sent you here? What agency? Who's paying for this time you're wasting? Who signs when you submit receipts? What do they have on you to bribe you? What's the threat they held about that very pleasing face? It's, it's that thing, like I said, there's tracks that I like and I don't know why I like them and then I went back and I realised it was because I thought they were, the synths were binding them together. You know, it's like that baking analogy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, it was, it was just bringing the ingredients together nicely. It's like a coherent uh, quality to it. And track nine as well, sing here, it's probably actually one of the ones that, maybe the best one for me. You want to acquiesce to this full probe if you still didn't want it. We've got our ways to make you speak. We've got our ways to make you talk. We've got our ways to make you speak. Kind of unusual. I like the kind of weirdness of it. I mean, I'm, I'm new to this and mm-hmm. coming at it from the cold, it stood out and amongst the other stuff. And it's, I don't know, musically that, that actually clicked a lot more than some of the, maybe the more straight in the line. Yeah, I mean, he's... He's really good at going in opposite directions, I think, sometimes as well. Like, the, the record starts to slow down a little bit, like, on the jig is up, all leading up to the big finish at the end. Stay Down as well is probably my least favourite song on the record. I got this boombox burner boy hot shit. Burn like a LA sunset, colourful, toxic, stuff, stuff, deadly and erotic. Walk like a man out of product, run like a strumpet, talk to the hand sock puppet. Look at them sky right, fuck it. We hard nothing, we don't have a tear for your bucket. Life's but a pageant, that into the deep shit. Try yeah, to- yeah, I'm... Um- there's a couple, yeah. It probably stay down. I, I don't think I've really listened to it. Mm-hmm. I'd probably skip that. Four dollar Vic. That's a banger. Like that that. Is, yeah, that's a dark record, man. Apparently, you worked on that for six years. Been working on that like way before this record. This and Stay Down, I think, had like multiple versions, and it, it was just like a last minute thing when they decided which one was going to go on the record. And um, Four Dollar Vic is definitely it. That's definitely about Kamatel. I think there's no question about that. And then you've got the bit at the end as well, which is the other half of the song. You and me. Yeah. Nothing but you and me. And that's like yeah, all about them, you know. And it's yeah, no, it's an interesting record because it is quite. A darkly personal record but it also has a lot of the other things that you know hints of humor uh and just sort of social commentary as well i do think it's definitely his, his best record mm. from the lp canon yeah i'm not sure if it's better than run the jewels 2 would this go in and we could nominate run the jewels at a later point i'm quite happy that we're nominating this because i don't think we need to nominate run the jewels yeah because i think all three of those records are very critically acclaimed mm. and getting massive reception. It's true. I think Killer Mike and LP, their solo stuff won't have nearly as many plays, or, you know, as the Run the Jewel stuff. Um, I personally would probably have gone for RAP music mm-hmm. uh, if I was going to choose someone from LP or Killer Mike because that record caught me a lot more than this one did. There's just something angrier about it and Killer like, Mike's a lot more aggressive as a, as a lyricist yeah, yeah and it, yeah. it just kind of caught me a little bit more but that's just maybe because I'm a total thug <laughs> uh, but I do really like, like this record uh, and from a LP perspective he's a really interesting guy you know fantastic producer really good rapper and I think this sums up what he's good at very well yeah I think it's definitely his pro- uh, well I think it will go down it's been the peak of his um, solo stuff unless he comes out with something totally banging in the next 10 years well it's, kinda, it's good from his perspective that it was the fourth of four records and he, he had a, mm. an upwards curve you know yeah I mean he's a little I didn't have a chance to talk about it I guess but the whole late bloomer thing like it's come in so late in their career both him and Killer Mike you know the, the success yeah of they're both the in their 40s aren't they really yeah. he's 43 now mm-hmm. which is quite in these times is really doesn't happen very often you know, uh, especially in that kind of music. I was thinking about that. I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't. It depends. And the longevity of bands is, I mean, it's, just, it's ridiculous now. It, it, I mean, we got Aussie. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but yeah. it's interesting that they've done like Run the Jewels have got that sort of push, 
without a major label uh, and they've done it you know at 40 because I think a major label wouldn't have ever given two old time hip hoppers uh, the time of day really because they'd never really sold any records they're um, still technically not selling records if they're releasing it for free as well well yeah that's true <laughs> but you know they're selling out capacity yeah. rooms so they're doing well um, yeah I really like this record yeah I mean they know that their bread is buttered on the publishing side anyway yeah I think that's I think that's why the hand is so hard because they know this is like the time they need to do it because it's just come at them in such in such a but also they sound quickly they, they do sound like they are inspired because they're not they're not pumping out shit that's true yeah like I said earlier on like three records and yeah in that space of time when it's taken LP a best part of 10 years to come up with to come up with four is pretty incredible output for a guy that takes a long time on this kind of thing you know so yeah no that's obviously a yes from me I, it's, it's fine mm-hmm. yeah I mean I like listening to it I don't have any deeper connection to it I was like oh it's cool the production's good cerebrally I was like yeah this is pretty good I could DJ this it's nice but it doesn't I don't know, like, you, you know me, I, I struggle to kind of be emotionally moved by hip-hop for whatever reason. So, it's fine. It's better than other stuff. Cool. Well, the continued uh, urbanisation of Chris Cusack will... Actually, I'm being gentrified. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Well, uh, go and vote on our Facebook page if you, if you please. David, what are we doing next week? Uh, what are we doing next week? I forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a belter. How could you forget? Uh, we are... Chris, you're going to fucking love this. Oh, I, I already know, David. We are going to do Carly Rae Jepsen's <laughs> Emotion. <laughs> and we're also going to talk emo- about Emotion Side B, which is a sort of uh, parallel album. But yeah, Emotion Bonus. by Carly Rae Jepsen. Two for the price of one as well. Hey, it's the least I can expect for the LaRue saga. Well, I'm going to show you how pop music is really, truly done. <laughs> oh my god. Let's, let's not go there just yet. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot.